Hello everybody and welcome to another Chrissy B Show special. Tonight we'll be looking back at some inspiring guests that I've had on this show. And previously we've revisited many stories including ones of depression and self-harm and actually commemorating those that come on this show to speak on national TV about things that they've been through. So today we want to look back again but this time about stories of personal triumph. The guests we'll be looking at today will remind us that no matter what life throws at you, you can get through it and that you can succeed in all areas of your life if you really want to. First up, we have the story of the then 12-year-old Joseph Willis and his mum, Katerina. Now, Joseph used his painful illness and turned it into something positive, something that we should all learn to do in general. Also, we recall when TV celebs, mentors and authors Renato and Cristiano Cardoso shared their lessons in love. They spoke about the time their relationship turned south and how they managed to turn it around. They are now relationship experts, so if your relationship right now is rocky or maybe it's going well and you want to keep it that way, then you should definitely stay tuned. But first up is the story of Katerina and her son Joseph, Will Joseph Wills who had a chronic and life-shortened condition called arterial tuosity syndrome. Now, just to read out what this actually is, this is according to rarediseases.org. ATS, which is the syndrome, is an extremely rare genetic disorder characterized by lengthening and twisting or distortion of arteries throughout the body. Arteries are the blood vessels that carry oxygen-rich blood away from the heart. Affected arteries are prone to developing balloon-like bulges on the wall of the artery, tearing or narrowing. The main artery that carries, carries blood from the heart and to the rest of the body can be affected. The pulmonary arteries are especially prone to narrowing. Additional symptoms affecting connective tissues entering in multiple systems of the body can also be present. Affective individuals may have distinctive facial features that are noticeable at birth or during early childhood. ATS can potentially cause severe life-threatening complications during infancy or early childhood, although individuals with milder symptoms have also been described. So this is a very rare condition, but Joseph has this, um, this syndrome. And even though he's in extreme pain, he still manages to be really, really positive, which I found really amazing. So let's take a look at his story. Hi, Katerina. Hello, Chris. Thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome. So, um, tell us about when Joseph was actually born, because obviously you're a new mum, mm -hmm. right? You must have been quite excited yeah, first and everything. Child, very excited. Yeah. Um, Joseph was full term, mm -hmm. and everything was fine at the birth. We were sent home, and um, for the first sort of six months or so, he was very poorly all the time. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of infections, chest infections, throat infections, and also. Um, I felt, even though I was a new mother, I, he was very floppy as a child. Mm. He couldn't sort of hold his head up properly and he felt sort of very floppy all the time. Couldn't, couldn't mm. move like other children, other babies could. What, what were doctors saying to you at the time when you, you know... That he was just a late thing. developer. Wow. That all, all children develop at different stages. Mm -hmm. um, at 10 months old, he developed a very severe chest infection and was taken to hospital. And at that point, they discovered he had a heart murmur. Right. And then it was basically... What is that? What does that entail? A heart murmur means um, that you're, it, there's an extra beat when they listen through a stethoscope, which means right. that either it's an infection or mm -hmm. there's some sort of um, condition, an underlying condition that's okay. causing that, that sort of beat, that extra echo in your heart. Yeah. Um, it was then six years, basically, of genetic testing and hospital visits, MRI scans to find out what Joseph actually had, the condition mm -hmm. he had. Okay, so but ha <coughs> obviously because you're a new mum, mm -hmm. first, first child and everything, so how did you um, react to the news that there was something wrong? And also even before that, even bef with all the, the illnesses that he was having, the infections, because obviously you needed to work and stuff yeah, like that. How sure. did you deal with all of that? I, I, I gave up work. I couldn't go to work and deal with all the illnesses. Mm. Um, once he was diagnosed with a heart murmur, I knew there'd be lots of hospital visits. I couldn't actually cope with working as well, what I to dedicate yeah. my whole time to to help in Joan being with him yeah, okay. as well. So how, did, how was life for like on a day-to-day -day basis and how did you um, cope with things? Full of worry. It was all yeah. worry to start with mm -hmm. and, and always watching him to, to, to see signs of, uh, of, of illness really mm -hmm. and getting him to a doctor straight away mm -hmm. if, if he was poorly because it wasn't diagnosed, it's very difficult because we didn't know, we didn't know what was wrong, but we knew there was something underlying there. Mm -hmm. So when he was, um, his first MRI scan, they discovered that his arteries were very tortuous, which means they're all twisted. 
right. although his heart was working exactly the same way as yours and mine it was the actual makeup of the heart mm. looked differently on scans right. so at that point they knew there was something underlying an underlying mm. issue um, he had also had problems when he walked with his joints He's, he has um, hypermobile joints mm -hmm. which is basically um, extreme double jointedness so which was the floppiness that I felt when he was, oh, right. he, when was, he, was young. when he was young yes so okay. he, he couldn't walk long distances mm -hmm. and always tired and always poorly Right. And how did you cope as a mum? Because there's obviously mums worry anyway, mm -hmm. that even if everything's okay, they're always worried about their children, they're always thinking about them, even just sending them off to school, some of them thinking about them all day if they're okay and everything. But mm -hmm. how, how did you actually deal with, with your own emotions? Did you have someone to talk to? Did, how did you deal with everything? It was, it was very difficult. Um, a supportive husband, mm -hmm. uh, we had to support each other. and. There wasn't anything, when, once his condition was diagnosed, there wasn't anything, any support out there because it's a rare condition. Right. So it's I, rare. How many people know? There's 100 worldwide, they think. Wow. 100 so, worldwide. Yeah, so there's, no, there's not a lot of information out there. A lot of the mm. information is, is medical for, right. for doctors. So it's very difficult to understand. Mm. But I just, I just focused all my, my energies on looking into the condition and finding hope. Mm -hmm. So really. he's... Is only the only person in the UK to have. He's this. the only child in the UK with a condition. It's the only one they've seen in the UK. Have you communicated with anyone else, any other parents? Yes. That... Um, a few years ago, Joseph actually set up a Facebook group page. Oh, Joseph set for up a condition. Oh, yeah, okay. and we actually found he's found for families in America mm -hmm. with a condition. So now we can talk to people that their children have the same conditions and understand. Yeah. So we're in contact now with sort of five families. In, oh, that's lovely. Yeah, in Germany and America. Mm -hmm. And how is that sort of helping you as well? Like? It's great because we can go backwards and forwards and talk to each other and say, did mm -hmm. your child do this? And are you, are you going through this at the moment? And how has that helped? And mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of a support network there for us. Okay. And it helps Joseph because he knows there are other people out there yeah. to talk to mm -hmm. with the same syndrome that he's suffering. Okay. And what, what would you say... Um, would be beneficial to you and Joseph, like if there was like more help out there, what would you think would be, would be good for you? Um, a little bit more information right. I think would be great mm -hmm. and support groups like other illnesses and diseases. Yeah. But I think it's very difficult because there are so few people and they are sort of very widespread across mm -hmm. the world. Okay. And I know, I know maybe there's mums watching now and they're like thinking, oh, I've got a poorly child and you know, I'm not sure what to do and I feel very sort of um, lonely and I feel why me what what advice would you would you give to them now I did go through all those emotions mm. I did think not particularly why me why him why why Joseph why mm. does he have to have all this and I blame myself and went through all those different emotions but I just I, I just I just think I just remain positive yeah. just there's How? always hope that? out there because I just think that if you believe that your child is going to be okay you know mm. there's always hope that, just because he, just cause he has a condition doesn't mean you, you shouldn't think the worst. Yeah, I mean and that's I that's really nice to to hear because there are people that at that stage they'll just give up. Mm. And I think once you get to that point where you give up and you're just sort of asking those questions, why did this happen? Why is, mm -hmm. why my child and everything? You never get past that stage no. of actually doing something. No. And positive. I don't I don't think there is a point to thinking back, thinking why it, it's not going to solve anything exactly. or, or fix anything. Yeah. So I think just move forward and try and do as much as you can to help that child. Yeah. And how about Joseph himself? How did he, obviously we're going to talk to him sure. in, the, in a while, but how did he cope like on a day-to-day -day basis and how did he deal with it? Or does he, 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 with it? he does, he deals with it very positively. I think he gets that from you, doesn't he? I don't, I don't, <laughs> he probably does. Very positive, yeah, yeah, he's a very positive, and I've always taught him to be positive about it. Yeah. And um, he does get knockbacks, but mm. he picks himself back up and he finds a way to get, get, get around those knockbacks by using them in a positive way, such as uh, if, he's, if he's bullied or teased, he'll find a way to, to write about that so that other children can learn from it. I and think, he, uh, uh, from what you're saying, I think you're an amazing mum and obviously your, your, you. your husband's in that as well to, to mm -hmm. help him because 
I think the child is a reflection of, of the parents as oh, well. So you. if you are negative all the time, mm -hmm. if a parent is negative, and this is about anything, even if like there's he you know you have a healthy child, but if you are constantly negative to that child, that child's going to pick up on that and it's going to start doing the same thing. But if you are as a parent positive about everything, mm -hmm. you, they follow that, they will copy you. Mm -hmm. And that's a reflection on, on mm -hmm. Joseph now, because he's doing some great, great things. You must be so he proud is. of I him. I am very, very proud of him, yes. yes. <laughs>
very quickly and then from that I started um, writing. I mm -hmm. used to come up with stories when I was little, yeah. always writing down in notepads and then I've always started books, tried to write them and then mm -hmm. I think one day I just decided I was going to write this and mm -hmm. it came this far. I never thought it would come this far. So had you sort of started before and then kind of not yeah. progressed with it? Why, I started and then stopped it and then I think I sort of moved on mm -hmm. from this story because I didn't really like it. Okay. And then I came back to it later on. I'd already mm -hmm. started writing it and I thought maybe it's like I, maybe I shouldn't come back to it because it's a very old thing mm -hmm. that I'd started writing. But I thought, no, I think if I want to write it, then I should go back. And Good I started writing it and got really far with it. Do you find that you express yourself quite well for your writing? Yes. And what you're, yeah, you know? I can express myself much better in writing mm -hmm. than I can when I'm actually talking face to face with a person. Well, I think you're expressing yourself really well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got a blog as well. Yes. Tell us, yeah. tell us about that. When did you start um, that? I've started it to sort of get people to know about my book. Mm -hmm. Um, started it just before it got published to sort of raise awareness about it, about publishers. Mm -hmm. um, I now also use it to tell people about my condition um, and to help people who might be getting teased or bullied because mm -hmm. of the, because of anything they might have. But why is it important for you to tell people about your um, condition? Do you think? Because I think it's sometimes I do at school um, get people giving me looks or. Mm -hmm. making fun of me in some way and it's really upsetting sometimes. Do they know the situation or are they just No, just they don't. Like kids and are normally. It's really important for me. I wanted to try not, I, I'm not really sure about giving, I'm not very good at giving advice to people who are being bullied, mm. but trying to talk to the bullies might not know they're actually bullying people and when, when they might be making fun of someone to take a step back mm -hmm. and realise what it might not be their fault about what you're um, yeah, it's true because sometimes people don't realise the, the impact no, of words. Yeah. The bullying might not yeah. be physical, but the, just the fact that, you know, you're already going through a lot and then someone comes and starts teasing you or, you know, you can't do this or all, all sorts of things that they, they might say because I was bullied at school as yeah. well, so I know what it's like. And you just feel terrible. Yeah, and yeah. for them, it was just a comment that they've, they've forgotten about. They've yeah, gone home, exactly. they're with their friends, they're just getting on with life. And then for you, that's hurt you yeah, so much impact. that you're thinking you're very, about it the whole day. Mm. You sort of find yourself in really contempt with those people because yeah. you're like, why, can, why don't they feel bad about what they've told me when I'm, I'm here crying about whatever mm. they've said to me or whatever? And you feel like, why don't they feel bad? Because mm -hmm. they probably don't even remember what they've they said don't. to you. No. Because sometimes it's just careless comments that yeah. people make. Mm -hmm. So I mean, so I think it's great what you're doing. So you. you're actually addressing the, the blog to to bullies as well to yeah. let them know. Tell us about one of the blogs that you maybe you've written about that. Um, I did do one quite recently. Mm -hmm. um, it was just saying about I don't know what um, what gave me the idea to do it. I just woke up one day and decided I was going to do it. Um, I was just saying to people that next time you look at someone and you're about to point it out to their friends, then take a step back. And just think, those people. What if those people see what I'm doing? How upset are they going to be? Mm. What kind of impact is it going to make on them? And mm -hmm. just try to trying to stop people from um, yeah. bullying people who where it isn't their fault. Definitely. And um, Joseph, what about people watch, watching now and they're saying, Do you know what? I've got so many problems right now. I can't see myself achieving my goals. I I've got dreams. Yeah. And I can't see myself achieving them because I've no. just go, I'm going through so much at the moment. What yeah. would you say to them? Um, I think it's best to, uh, if if it's something you can't help, then there is no point in worrying about it. If mm -hmm. if like if your dream is something that that you can't, um, if your dream is something that you can do, yeah, physically, then just do it. I think, mm -hmm. um, despite is your it? worries. Yeah, you can find a way to do yeah, things. You can, yeah. yeah. You can definitely find a way you to do You said to me this. there's nothing to lose by no, there isn't. trying. No. Yeah, exactly. I mean you, you said you weren't expecting it to get this far with no, the book. Was that always your dream to write a book? Yes, it was. I've always wanted to write books since mm -hmm. I was very young. Yeah. And how does it feel now sort of seeing that dream coming true for you? Mm, not real. <laughs> <laughs> I still can't believe I've written it. It still feels like I've I'm sitting there, I've written one chapter and uh -huh. I it still feels like it's not gonna get very far when in real life I've actually finished it and it's yeah. going to be published. I just can't believe 
Wow. That's happened. Okay, and how, how, how has the mum and dad, have they supported you through all um, this? Because they, they seem great. Yeah, they've been really good. Because mm -hmm. whenever I've been feeling really down about anything, they've always helped me to mm -hmm. pick myself back up, feel really positive, and yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be emotionally in the place that I am today without mm -hmm. my mum and my dad, really. Oh, well, I'm going to get emotional. <laughs> OK, let me get myself together. OK, <laughs> Mum. <laughs> Sorry, was it? Okay. Mum, how, how do you feel about everything that Joseph's doing with, with the book and everything else? Really proud that he's managed to turn such a negative, horrible illness mm -hmm. into something so positive, really, and that yeah. he's just carried on. Yeah. And, you know, achieving his dreams, not letting mm -hmm. anything get in the way. Because it's so easy yeah. just to say, I can't do this because of this, 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 this. But he's, he's kind of moved that on. And that's thought, the what, easy, what can I do? That's the easy thing to do, isn't it? To Finding say, problems yeah. is very easy. Yeah, yeah, we can all do that. Because everyone yeah. can think of a million reasons yeah. why we can't do something. Yeah. But then yeah. when you, once you set your mind to say, I can, mm -hmm. that's when you're going to start to look for opportunities. Yeah. That's when you're going to yeah. start to find ways yeah. of doing things that maybe you didn't even think of before. But once yeah. you say you can't, it's like the possibilities just mm. shut off. You don't yeah. see anything. No. You don't see any, no. any way that you can do things. But we did used to get very upset about things he couldn't do and try and find a way he could do those. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then we kind of thought, oh, why he can't do them. Why put him through that? Let's find yeah. things he can do and, so and use amazing. those. That's so inspiring. So what was really great about this story was that you can see how mature Joseph's way of thinking is. So what he did was he used his negative situation in life, his illness, and turned it into something positive. And that takes a lot of courage to do. Now, people can sometimes think of loads of reasons why they can't achieve their goals or do better in life. But while some are actually busy thinking of every excuse under the sun about why they can't do something, others are busy finding ways where they can. And by the way, if you have missed a really, this really inspirational story and any other stories um, that we've had on this show, please do head over to our YouTube channel, Chrissy B Show. You can subscribe and watch everything there in your own time. And also, if you want to share your own story, do head over to our website, chrissybshow.tv, and contact us through there. Now, after this quick break, we move on to our next guests and their triumphant love story, only here on The Chrissy B Show. Hi, I'm Chrissy B, and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 p.m. on my channel, Sky203. Visit chrissybshow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. Hi everyone, and if you've just joined us, today we're doing a show all about the inspirational stories we've heard on this program. Now these interviews we did on the show will remind us that no matter what life throws at you, you can succeed, you can get through it if you get the right help and if you're willing to go that extra mile. So just before the break, we saw again the story of then 12-year-old Joseph Willis and his mum Katerina. So as you saw, Joseph had a very rare condition, but he fought through and now he's doing, he's doing really well and he's had a very, very positive attitude. And I'm going to look back at when I met up with TV celebs, love experts and authors of the book Bulletproof Marriage, Renato and Cristiani Cardoso. So they went through quite a few problems in their relationship and they managed to turn things around. So let's hear from them. Hi. Oh, it's so great to have you here in the studio with us. We are happy to be here. Thank oh, you for having God. us. So how was Wembley for you? Because that obviously was a fantastic event. But what was it like for the two of you seeing all those people? <laughs> she loved it from the, from, from the get-go because I, was, I keep joking with her that I'd never seen her greet the crowd. <laughs> Uh, the way well, that she the, greeted the, crowd the Wembley took crowd. took it out of me. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, they, were, they were lovely, weren't they? They were, such a lovely they were. They yeah. were. Uh -huh. so, what, so what was it like for you? Because I know you've been also touring. You've done the love school in other countries as well. Mm -hmm. how, how has that been compared to the UK? Is it sort of quite different, people quite different everywhere you go? Or you get the general same response? Generally, it's the same because people, uh, the problems we deal with, the love life problems, relationship problems are very universal. Mm. And so in that sense, it's, it's pretty much the same. 
what we found about the UK as we were preparing for this event was we knew we know that generally okay. relationships are going bad all over the world, yeah. right? It's a it's a, it's a trend, um, but we were shocked to find out the statistics uh, mm -hmm. in the UK as we were preparing for for the the talk at Wembley, and so that that made made it a bit of of a bigger challenge for us. We were uh, ready to face it. We were ready to make it really strong mm -hmm. because people really need it. Uh, considering what's going on in the country, you see the, the, the government trying to come up with the marriage tax now to try and curb the problem, but we think there's a lot more effort needed. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like I was saying at the beginning, because the, all those people were there because they wanted to learn about love. Like I said, we didn't, you know, that there wasn't much advertising about the entertainment. They didn't know about the prize draw, so I know they weren't there for those things, but they were actually interested to, to hear what you both had to say mm -hmm. about love, because it is a, a major problem here in the UK. Yes. Now, what I, what I really loved about um, when you were speaking, you're very open about your own problems that you had in your marriage. What makes you so comfortable just to sort of air everything like that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing that for quite a long time and you know yes. it. I guess that's, uh, I think that's the best way to help anybody, you know, mm -hmm. when you, you know exactly what uh, that person is going through. With your own yeah. experience, you, you, you let the person identify herself or himself with you. Because mm -hmm. sometimes people, uh, they give so much theory, you know, oh, this is how it's done, that, that's how it's done, but how, how do you do it? And when you tell the person how it's done, you know, how you did it, it's another thing. You mm -hmm. help them much better in a better, much more effective way. So we like to do it that. Yeah, yeah I like think to... also because people usually get it from the media, from TV, movies and, and stuff they get the two extremes. Either they get the idea that uh, marriage is this wonderful thing and, you know, butterflies and, <laughs> and birds flying over your head, uh, or it's this horrible thing, stay away from it. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, <laughs> it's a different extreme. Yeah, it's, it's, it's two different extremes, <clears throat> but what we're, we're saying with our experience is that with 22 years of marriage, and the first half of this 22 years, we had our share of problems. We were mm -hmm. saying to people, look, yes, it hadn't been, hasn't been perfect for us. It, it wasn't perfect for us. Uh, we went through problems. And by the way, a lot of people, this is much more common than, than most people think. Mm -hmm. um, all the couples, no matter how well matched they are, they will have their share of problems. But here's how we did it, how we turned it around. So it, it's effective, like Chris said, because people can relate and we are also telling them how we did it and it's transferable. What worked in our marriage can work in any marriage mm -hmm. and, and that's what has been resonating with people. If we had people telling us of their experiences when we were going through these problems, we wouldn't have felt like we were the only ones, mm -hmm. you know, and that's like how aliens, I felt. Like right? <laughs> and that goes Something across wrong the board. With us, yeah, yeah. That goes across the board because a lot of people, they go through so many problems and because they think they're the only ones that are going through it, they tend to kind of keep it to themselves and they get really close and that's when they start to get depressed and all these other problems come. But it's so refreshing when people do talk about their issues because then they can say, well, I'm not the only one, I can get help. If they did it, I can as well, which is, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. So... Now, at the Love School event, you spoke about... Um, actually, no, I want to know a bit about the problems, actually, because for the benefit of those that weren't at the Love School, my commiserations if you missed it, by the way, because, you know, I don't know what I can say to you. But I think there's a DVD coming out, and we'll tell you more about that another time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but tell us about some of the sort of main issues that you had, what, what caused it in your marriage, and then how you resolved them. We, we married very young, and we don't say that that is a problem in itself. It can be a blessing, can be a curse if you're not oh. prepared for it. But we married very young, and the problem wasn't the age, I don't think. The, the main problem was that as we got married, um, I devoted myself completely to my work. Right. And I kind of shelved Christiani. And, and <laughs> after having conquered her, which is a very common problem, for men, they go through the courting period and they invest a lot into conquering the girl. Once they feel they've taken the girl to the altar and she said yes, mm -hmm. they said, I've done it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> my part here is done. What's the next challenge? Mm -hmm. And my next challenge was to prove myself at my work. Mm -hmm. And having turned to that, I completely neglected my wife. And then she began to 
to feel <laughs> that, obviously. But did you realize that you were doing that? Or was no. it just so into your work that you didn't? I didn't realize that you at the time. You thought that was no. a problem. I thought, <laughs> I, thought, I thought, what's wrong with her? Because, <laughs> you know, doesn't she, she, I was doing the same kind of work I, I was doing when I was single, right? Mm -hmm. So she knew the kind of work I did. She knew how demanding it was. And now I was, I was thinking she, she was being unreasonable because she knew that going in. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, but that was it for you. <laughs> before he did take the time to get to know me, to talk to me, yeah. and after he was like, you know, I know you already, we're married, so we don't have to invest anymore. How did that make you feel? Horrible. <laughs> because I, I was young, I was 17 when I got married. So, mm. and I had these great expectations because I, I my father and my mom, they, they're married now for 40, more than 40 years. Mm -hmm. And so I, I expected that when I got married, like that husband who would take care of me, who would mm -hmm. spare me from many things, who would just be lovely. And I got that for a year. <laughs> I'll be, you know, I won't say I never got it. I got it for a year. And then after wow, the year. first year of marriage, then things started going down. That's because down I couldn't down. work for the one year. I was mostly studying. <laughs> <laughs> so there was more done. time. <laughs> yeah. So it was very bad. I try, to, uh, I try to use all kinds of things that women normally do, like nagging and then crying and then, you know. The crying thing doesn't really work, does it? <laughs> yeah. like, no, it doesn't, work. <laughs> it doesn't work. I think we've all tried that at some point. <laughs> <laughs> the nagging, yeah. you know, oh, sometimes... Yeah. We tried that many, many times. <laughs> we think it's going to work at some point. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So I tried everything. And, and because he, he would always tell me, you know, you married me this way. I was like this before. And in a way, he was, we were different because mm -hmm. I am more, uh, I'm more the, the, the spontaneous kind, the mm -hmm. one that likes to go out and, and have fun. And he was always more to, to the work, more serious, yeah. more focused. And it I saw that. He didn't seem like that at the, at the love school. But I know, <laughs> because it was work. Because that's work. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm more, I'm more of a homebody, like to stay home, and she likes to go out. So that was also an issue, uh -huh. because since I worked so much, any little time I got, I wanted to be home. And that, and that was the time she wanted to go out. So again, this, <laughs> You wanted this, to be home and sleep. Yeah, yeah, this mismatch of expectations. I mean, you laugh about it now, but obviously back then it was a, a huge issue for you both, wasn't it? I mean, you were, you were in yeah. tears a lot and... Yeah, it was... Uh, it was a huge issue. I mean, one time he he gave up. Okay, all right, I'll take you someplace. But he had this long face. Uh, several times I did that. And he took me to the movies with that long face. I, I was like, oh, so what do, we, what do you want to watch? I don't care. <laughs> you know, what do you want to watch? I don't care. Horrible. I'm not really... <laughs> So, <laughs> but that so, just goes to prove that it doesn't work. What a lot of people do is that they they try to force the other person to mm -hmm. change or to be the way they want them to be, and that doesn't work, right? And I was wrong, no doubt. But she was she was wrong because she was trying to force her way onto me and make me the way she wanted me to be. And I also mm -hmm. wanted her to be the way I wanted her to be. And that's where couples um, uh, get at, at loggerheads because they, they keep trying to force their way into each other. They, they don't stop to learn that that's a different human being. You have to study that person. You have to understand their motivations, what drives them, their personality, mm -hmm. and try to adapt to them, to try and live together. But of course, at the time, that you know that. Didn't, didn't and it doesn't mean it doesn't choice. mean that the person is never going to change because we did change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it doesn't mean when you, because because uh, the idea is like if you don't do anything about it, you're going to suffer that difference for the rest of your life, mm -hmm. right? But that doesn't mean you're going to go through that. It's just that you don't. You need to understand how to to get what you want in a different in way. A different not way. nagging, not crying, mm -hmm. not making a scene because that doesn't work, you know it. Well, don't go away because after this break, we'll take a look at part two of this interview with this love duo. So I'll see you right after this.
Hi, I'm Chrissy B and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10 p.m. on my channel Sky203. Visit chrissybshow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. Welcome back everybody. So if you've just joined us, today we're revisiting some of our stories, inspirational stories that we've had on this program. So we've already watched the story of Joseph Wills, who's a 12 year old that was at, then when we interviewed him, he was going through a very rare condition. And his, what was remarkable is his attitude about the whole thing and how he hasn't let it put him down, but he's actually doing what he loves. And we've also seen the first part of Renato and Cristiani Cardoso's story as well, because they used to go through quite a difficult time in their relationship, but they managed to turn things around and they are now love experts, helping people all over the world and have written a book called Bulletproof Marriage that's helping thousands and thousands of people. So let's now go to the second part of their interview. they're going to tell us about loving intelligently because that's something that you speak about quite a lot because most people do say oh follow your heart that's the right way and do whatever your heart says but you're dead against that aren't you very very much that's that's been the problem in our opinion yeah. um with a lot of people and a lot of relationships it's this message follow your heart okay. just imagine to give an analogy if you would jump into into the passenger seat uh, where the driver is a drunk teenager Right, mm -hmm. you know how teenagers, especially men, yeah. love to drive fast, mm -hmm. and if they're drunk, I don't think you would, right? Mm -hmm. But that's exactly what people uh, risk when they let their hearts lead them. The heart just wants emotions, just wants the thrill, just wants the, the feelings, the good feelings. It doesn't care so much about the consequences. And when the, the, the thrill is, is over, the heart goes like, so what next? What mm -hmm. happened? And, and it loses interest. And when people go into a relationship by letting their heart lead them, that's what happens. They can get very excited at first. They may overlook a lot of important information that, about the other person that will compromise the relationship later. And then once they get in, they get involved already, then that's when they wake up or either the, the, the interest goes down, the emotion, the passion goes down. Mm -hmm. And that's when they start saying, oh, I'm not in love with this person anymore. You know, the chemistry is not there anymore and all that kind of stuff. And that's, that's one of the, the biggest problems people are facing. So what we're saying is people have to love intelligently, meaning letting their head lead their mm -hmm. heart. And when we talk about intelligence, what is intelligence in, in a basic meaning? It's, it's information that you can use. It's information that, that's useful, something you can, that can help you. So when you love intelligently, that means you look at everything about the other person, about yourself, and for example, problems. You start th thinking, okay, what can I do about this? What does this problem tell me about um, the solutions that, that are available to me. For example, mm -hmm. we had the problem of, of attention, lack of attention and jealousy that she had, insecurities. As long as we went uh, against each other emotionally, we only fought. But when we stopped and learned to use our heads, we discovered the root of the problem, why mm -hmm. she was insecure, why I was an, a workaholic. And then that information gave us the ability to come up with solutions. So we fixed the problem. And we fixed the problem in such a way that it wouldn't come back, it wouldn't return, it wouldn't happen again. Now, you've written put up quite a bit about this in your book, Bulletproof Marriage. Mm -hmm. You had the book signing yesterday, didn't you, as well? Yes. How did that go? <laughs> Very <laughs> nice. I'm getting my book signed today. <laughs> <laughs> Can I? <laughs> sure. <laughs> now, now, you've actually compared uh, relationships to working in a company. Mm -hmm. That's quite an interesting concept to, to follow because, like you're saying, about loving intelligently. Mm -hmm. that, that is actually like working in a company, isn't it? Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, the, the, the main idea behind it is that emotions are the wrong tool to solve problems. Mm -hmm. No one at work solves problems by feeling the problems. Oh, I feel like I'm going to make a good sale today, or I feel like I'm going to uh, solve this problem in the HR department or in the sales department today. Mm -hmm. No. You, you, you solve problems at work using your head. 
you collecting data, you collect intelligence, right? You think and you come up with, with possible solutions. And you separate the, the feelings from the actions that you have to take. For example, beginning from Monday morning, you don't, a lot of people don't feel like going to work Monday morning, but they have to, they go. They ignore their feelings and they do what is right. And in a relationship, you have to use those skills. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of it is that they are already inside you because if you are successful at any job, at any work, you already have the ability to separate emotion from, mm -hmm. from intelligence. So you just need to transfer those skills to your relationship. And that's, and that's what works. Don't take it personally every time. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, um, at the Love School event as well, you spoke about um, rebuilding yourself and you're actually currently doing um, some, some follow-up seminars about rebuilding yourself. Why is that important and how does that affect the love life? Well, a lot of people, um, they, they're, they're not ready to be in a relationship, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So if you're not ready to be in a relationship and you are, you know, you have your own set of problems and then the other person, it's just unfair for the other person because you, you tend to put all those problems into that relationship and makes it even harder. A relationship by itself is already difficult. You need to adjust many things. Now, if, if the individuals in that relationship, they're not all right with themselves inside, mm -hmm. then it makes it even harder. And sometimes people go from one relationship to the other thinking the problem is with everybody but they don't know that they need to, to work in themselves first. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing, we have been doing on Sundays. Yeah, most, most people in, re in a relationship, they can only see the other person's problems. They can't see their own. And we usually say marriage problems don't exist. Why? Because what really exists... Marriage problems don't exist. Don't exist. What really exists are two different people with their own sets of problems desperately trying to fix the other person. Oh, that's an interesting concept. <laughs> it makes sense though. <laughs> yes, yeah. because the relationship itself, the problems in the, of the relationship are individual problems that are not addressed. And usually one tends to project the problems onto the other and expect mm -hmm. the other to change and, and condition their own change to the other person's change. Like, if you change, then I change. And that's mm -hmm. completely the wrong way of approaching it. So the idea to rebuild yourself is, if you think, for example, if you could tear your house down and rebuild it, if you had the resources and the opportunity to do it, you'd probably not build the same house. You'd probably build a better one, right? With better materials, better space, etc., to adjust to your current needs. And we've discovered that you can do that, contrary to what people think, that people can't change, nobody can change. People can change, you can change yourself. Mm -hmm. But for you to, to do that, you need to, to be able to break down what you're made of, right? What are we made of? What are the foundations of our lives? What is the, 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 what is the structure? What is the roof of our life? What are the walls, the pillars? What is the site where we are, we are standing on? The roots that hold us together. So there we have it, a very inspirational couple proving to us that any, any situation can turn around even in love. Well, Sally, that's all we have time for on today's programme. But if you have a story that you'd like to share or if there's a subject that you'd like to see us talking about on this programme, please do get in touch with us, chrissybshow.tv. You can get in touch with us through the website. Also, you can tweet us at chrissybshow and also via our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. And the main thing that I want to leave you with um, from today's program is that you shouldn't give up on life because I know sometimes things can seem pretty harsh. You could be going through some really hard times. You wonder, why me? Why is this happening to me? I don't deserve this. And all those kind of questions that you might have in your mind. But the important thing is to remember is that you are stronger than what you think you are. And with the right help, the right guidance, you can get through absolutely anything. And if you'd like to know more about me and how I overcame depression and panic attacks and many other issues, you can head over to my website, mylifeafterdepression.com. Until next time, bye-bye for now.